and off I went. So I joined Army at 17 and I came out when I, I got a dishonourable discharge from Army. A lot of people probably don't know this, actually. I've never really spoken about it. So I, I wanted to get back home and, and, and be back in UK. So I, I spoke to him and I said, look, I want to get posted back home. I've got a few things going on or a few things have happened. What you know, I could do with just being back home. And they're like, no, you're staying here. So I'm like, fucking hell, how am I going to get out of this? What's me? But yeah. I, was that, I, I was pissed off and angry, so I'd find myself going out around town in Germany and just being a, a tear away and a bit of a toe rag and got myself in trouble with military police once or, ta- uh, once or twice. And then they said to me, uh, they put me on what's called a three-month warning order. So when that happens in the military, you get cross-posted to a different uh, squadron. So they cross-posted me to a different squadron. And basically in that three months, if you do anything wrong, you're gone. So I was just like, well, fucking easy. I'll just stop turning up for, for, for parade and for work and that. So um, so I did that. I got put in front of the CEO and I got sent on the way. And so I was back home. I was back home at like 21. Went back up Normington. How, how old are you when you got into rugby? Because everyone always has the same story, doesn't it? Their dad took them down the club or something like that. Or were you a bit older? Because I know you turned professional quite late. Yeah, I started... Um, I started, and my, my story were different because my dad were never from a background of, of rugby. My dad, um, my dad was from Sheffield. He's got no interest in any, any sport, really. He followed my career and got into rugby league on the back of that. But I, um, <clears throat> it was funny, I, I remember it like plain as day. I was on a, a school field where there were a, a school match on. I was on it, must have only been eight or nine years old. High school, we were over, um, it was like a, a street away from where I lived. And I was playing there, I met this kid. Um, and we just got uh, talking and they were telling me I play for Norman and uh, rugby mate. We were on a kid, like I said, we were on a kid, eight, nine year old. And he said, you should come up. <clears throat> and I somehow stayed in contact with him back then. We didn't have mobile phones or whatever. I never, oh, met, yeah. ne- never met this kid before. So I, I must have said, I live at this place, come and call for me and, and we'll go together or whatever. So I went, uh, went up rugby training with him and I was probably about eight or nine. Um, and then from there, I loved it, got stuck into it. My granddad always used to take me to watch Cast Tigers. So I was a big Cast fan, um, but I probably never would have got... Well, I, I might have got into rugby at some point, but I wouldn't have got in it at such a young age if it weren't for meeting Craig Hayward, is his, his name, an old, old pal of mine. Were, were you a good player right off the bat, or were you one of these that... Because you're not one that relied on his size. Or, now you always find, like, under nines, under tens and that, you have that kid that's a mutant who's about six foot three and a beard and that, and they're running right. But when they get to 16, <laughs> they're just useless, aren't they? So, like, you always find the littler players have got the more skill because they've had to evolve. Yeah. I, I, I were I were never... I were, ne- I were never mega-talented and all like that. I was just always probably t- tenacious, if anything. Just I always... I always had that, um, almost, like I just always wanted to win. Just always had that little bit of grit and a little bit of determination. And I, like I said, I was never I was never a superstar in the team. I was always a good player within a team. Going through age groups, I'd normally get a trophy on presentation and stuff like that. But um, there were players in and around my, my team and age groups who were far better than me, far more talented than me. And then I, um, I got to like probably... What would I have been? I left, cause I'm one of the youngest in my year group. So I left school at 15. And some of my mates at the time were getting signed up on uh, academy or scholarship contracts, whatever the war back then. And I never, never, never got one. And I was a little bit disheartened by it. And I just thought, oh, well, it's maybe, maybe not meant to be. I won't say disheartened to the point of I was gutted and devastated and all that. But I was just like, oh, well, fuck it then. It's, it's not kind of happening for me. So went to college, lasted. Uh, about two or three months, <laughs> yeah. dropped out of co- dropped out of college, and then I uh, walk in through army uh, through Wakefield and past Army Careers Office, and I just stuck my head in there and uh, just said, w- "What goes off in there? Like, can you show me what do I need to do if I want to try and get an army?" So I did literally did a touch touch screen test there and then, and they said, "Right, if you want to pursue it further, you can go to Scotland for two days at this day, this time, whenever it was." Now we're only, now we're only 17, must have just turned 17 when I started that process. Um, and before I knew it, I was in basic training and, and off I went. So I joined Army at 17 and I came out when I, was, I got a dishonourable discharge from Army. A lot of people probably don't know this, actually. I've never really spoken about it at great depth, but I, um, 
I got a dishonourable discharge. So what happened when I went in army? I I was still playing while I was going through my training. I was still coming home on a weekend, playing for Norman and Knights, second team and first team occasionally. And I would I was always doing all right. If I went and played for second team, I'd score two or three tries a game. And if I played for first team, I'd maybe come off bench and have a dig and uh, got to a point where there were some semi-pro clubs who would have been willing to give me a, a, a crack at semi-pro if I'd have been based in UK. So when it came to my posting, I got sent to Germany. Yeah. So so that was pretty much the end of my rugby league career, really, because I got sent to Germany. <clears throat> I went to Germany when I were I finished my training. I would have been probably 19 when I went to Germany. So I went to Germany. Uh, bear it in mind at the time when I were in the army, you used to put three choices for your postings. So I put uh, UK North, UK South. You had to put an overseas one on there. So I put UK North, UK South, Cyprus, the fucking sent me to Germany. <laughs> so, so, I were, so I were like spitting feathers about that. I were, I were pissed off about that. Um, but I went to Germany, uh, went off to Iraq and served in Iraq while, while I was in Germany. And then I was trying to get posted back to UK because I, 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 had, I had the confidence and the belief that I could at least make it semi-pro. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I was trying to get posted back to UK. Um, and at the time, there were a few things happened, uh, like in, in my personal surroundings, where I probably wanted to be at home. You know what I mean? So I, I wanted to get back home and, and, and be back in UK. So I, I spoke to him and I said, look, I want to get posted back home. I've got a few things going on or a few things have happened. What, you know, I could do with just being back home. And they're like, no, you're staying here. So I'm like, fucking hell, how am I going to get out of this? What's me? But yeah. I, was that, I, I was pissed off and angry. So I'd find myself going out around town in Germany and just being a tear away and a bit of a toe rag and got myself in trouble with military police once or, t- uh, once or twice. And then they said to me, uh, they put me on what's called a three-month warning order. So when that happens in the military, you get cross-posted to a different uh, squadron. So they cross-posted me to a different squadron. And basically, in that three months, if you do anything wrong, you're gone. So I was just like, well, fucking easy. I'll just stop turning up for, for, for parade and for work and that. So um, so I did that. I got put in front of the CO and I got sent on my way. And so I was back home. I was back home at like 21 Went back up Normanton, um, playing for Normanton. Had a trial at Hunslet. Oh no, sorry. Had a trial at Wakefield Trinity first, under twenty ones. Uh, Shane McNally were coaching at the time. I don't know if you remember that far back. Um, and I think I must have played eight games for their academy, or their under twenty ones. And I, I got to a point where I said, "Look, will there be anything for me, or do I need to just go back to my amateur club?" Or try and find something else and they said there's not going to be nothing for you um go go on elsewhere and good luck kind of thing then i got a trial at Hunslet. uh i think i played one game uh their coach pretty much said i weren't good enough went back to normanton then i got a trial at doncaster um and then i got a lucky break at doncaster because the get the kid that were playing fullback at the time i went to bed as a halfback by the way i was always a halfback as a, as a kid uh, I was never, like I said, I was never the most skillful or talented, but I was just quite tenacious and I could bossy and a bit of a mouth on me. Um, so I went to Doncaster as a halfback, but they had Graham Holroyd, who used to play for Leeds. Oh, yeah. Was, oh, yeah. They had the Graham Holroyd and they had a, quite a senior. Um, he, he was always a good uh, low level player called Lathan Tawai, Tai Fire. I can't remember how you pronounce his name, but he, he would have uh, Kiwi. And they had him and Graham Allroyd in the half. So I went as a trialist, played a couple of games in the halves in the Northern Rail Cup or whatever it was called back then. And then it came to beginning at season. And Sinjin Ellis, what coach, he said, just so you know, uh, obviously Latham and Graham are going to be the starting halfbacks. Um, so you're not going to get a crack. And I'm like, fucking hell, what have I, I'm just thinking to myself, what have I got to do? Like to, yeah. But then it will it, it will literally, I don't know if it were, it might have been the the week up to the first game of the season or the, the training session before. I can't remember exactly when it was. But um, Sinjin Ellis rang me after one of the training sessions and he said, look, mate, we've got an opening for you. This fullback's just decided to tell us today that he's not going to be playing. He's quitting. Uh, have you ever played fullback? Do you fancy it? And I said, no, but yeah, I'll, I'll, give, it a, I'll give it a crack. 
and that were it. So, so I did it from there. I went. I played at Doncaster 2005. Had a good year, like, um, like just a raw. Uh, that was the house of pain, wasn't it, Doncaster? I'm sure Sinjin yeah, yeah, used to call right, it. Yeah, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember it. it. Yeah, yeah. Used to try and intimidate people, turn showers off and stuff like that. Was yeah, that was always yeah. the the deal, wouldn't it? It was just a character, mate. It was just a, a massive character with Sinjin Elishu. I never really, never got to thank him because when I left for for Hull KR the following year. He died the New Year's Eve for pre-season right. in 2006. He, he died on the training field after a, a pre-season session. Um, but obviously, if he didn't give me that chance and that, that lucky break kind of didn't come, I would have never played uh, as, as long as I did. So I, I had to go a long way around it, but I got there. And like I said at the beginning, I was never fully aware that I would never attack, like. Talented, uh, I always think though you always. can tell players that have gone the other way around. It's like uh, Alex Wormsley. Yeah. You can tell he hasn't been in a Super League system since he was young because he's not finding his elbows, knees. He's trying to break through tackles, which, yeah. uh, like, let's be honest, that isn't a thing anymore, is it? You don't get props coming on under mile an hour. It's all footwork, hit the floor, quick play of the yeah. ball. The game's changed, whereas you can tell he's just like a, like a good amateur that's breaking through ties. And I I prefer them type of players because they're a bit more. Yeah off the cuff and stuff like that. People have, like, them systems, I think, in Super League, I think they're a bit rigid. Do you know, like, that's just a person, like, you, no, one I, goes I, through, one out the back. And I just think, you can tell them players that have come from, like, Kyle Amo, when he first went in Super League, come from Whitehaven, a bit more rough and tumble. And yeah. them players that have gone up, like yourself, you think, it, he doesn't play like a normal Super League wing. He's not trying to do, you know what I mean? I always think you yeah, can yeah. tell a little bit. Yeah. But, it, like I said, got there through... And again, it, it, I, I, don't, I won't say I got, got there through um, being a, a super skillful or super talented player, just more probably work ethic and like desire. Even in yeah. training, even in training and all that, I've always been competitive. And, um, so that's, that probably carried me through my career. That's probably why I had a career uh, 14, 15 years. I'm actually playing again next year for Donny. I played back end of this year for him. Um, went up to Cumbria a couple of times, actually working to. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah. Got, got, got beat in that fight. Where about St. Cumbria? Just like outside that? Whitehaven, just out, right. outside there, uh, yeah. But so I mean, like, like you said, Doncaster are doing quite well now, aren't they? There? Who's the coach now at Doncaster? Richard Horn. Richard Horn, that was it. I from yeah. Paul, wasn't it? Ah, yeah. yeah. So he, it was interesting, that, because I just got a, call, I got a random call off a kid called Sam Smeaton, who uh, used to be a centre at Featherstone. I had a short spell at Featherstone in the end of 2011. I think I played about I don't know, nine or ten games. And Sam on my centre. Uh, and I got a phone call off him. It would have been probably June, July time. And I spoke to him and said, what's Sam ringing me for? I haven't really spoke to him for a long time. And he just said, uh, what are you up to? Fancy putting your boots back on. I didn't even know where they were playing. I said, where are you playing? He said, I'm at Doncaster. He said, we've, we've, had a, we've been short of it through COVID. And... Um, <clears throat> We've had some injuries. We're just trying to ring around and get some players together. So I said, well, fuck it. I've kept myself fit. I'll, I'll come and have a crack. Well, that, that's a thing, isn't it? If you're still <laughs> fit and you're, you're healthy yeah. and stuff like that. And I, especially rugby league, you went and played halfback, didn't you? Played hooker yeah, for them. I hope that, I, I think because it like yeah. older head and stuff like that, hooker, standoff, scrum half. Yeah. People like Liam Finn and players, great players, but they're not relying on speed, are they? They're not people no. like Sean and Gorn anymore. They've just got the head on them. The guy at Dewsbury as well, I think he, he's the oldest Actually. player. Yeah, like, I, I don't know how old he is, because he was playing when I was a child. He's over 40. He's over yeah. 40. He uh, played with Sykes at Wakefield, and he was great for us at Wake. He won us that many games with drop goals or penalty conversions. Um, it won't surprise me if he goes around again next year. He might, he might not play as often as he has done, but... To play championship, at, at, I know you got Steve Menzies who played Super League at 40, 41, whatever he was. He was just a, obviously a freak of a talent. But even championship at 40 years old, I, I just think it's it's a brilliant achievement because they're not... You, uh, what I found with a, with a lower level compared to the higher level is it's more... Like like you talked about at the beginning there with Wormsley, it's more about who can run the hardest and who can belt you yeah. the hardest. It's not about who's the most skillful and who's this, that or the other. So it's more, I find the collision and the, and the physical side of it is still very intense at that level. So good on Sykes for still carrying on at that age. 
Well, I always find it weird when you hear your Super League player saying, I'm dropping down to the championship. I want to spend more time with my family. And I thought, you're going to have to get a job for starters. So there's 40 hours a week. You're going to have to train two or three nights a week. And potentially every Sunday, you're going to be at Whitehaven, yeah. Coventry. And so I always think that's a bigger commitment. Whereas you always make out like, oh, I'm just going part-time now. You think, I think you'll get a shock. Whereas you went yeah. the other way. You, you'll know how hard it was going into Super League. Did, did, did you feel like that was a big jump? Or did you think, oh, this is better. All I've got to do is worry about rugby. Um, but when, when I signed at OKR 2006, that were a, that were they were full time from that year, so we were full time in the championship. I think they were only full time team. Oh no, Witness might have been as well. I think Witness were because they'd signed um, Barry McDermott, Terry O'Connor. Uh, they had some big names in their team, um, <coughs> so it was pretty much us and them battling it out to get promoted to Super League. But the difference, obviously, uh, from training two nights a week at Doncaster and you know, pitch black under some poxy little floodlights to train in during the day at total fitness on rowing machines and even lifting weights, what I've probably never really done before. Um, it's totally different, mate. Yeah, so the, the difference were unbelievable. And I remember that first year we did get into Super League. Um, we'd had a fair, pre fair pre-season under his belt and we got off to a flyer. I think we won four out of his first five games. So that kind of set us up because the back end, we really started to drop off. And I think that start that we had in Super League, that probably kept us up really, winning four out of those first five. Because you had that Aussie coach, and he played like a nice brand of rugby. Was it Justin? Morgan, yeah. Justin Morgan, Morgan, that was it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he, he, he used the wingers, didn't he? He, was, he had that Kiwi guy on the other wing who used to score a lot of tries yeah. as well. And you, you can four. tell, the, it's like Powell at Castleford. You can tell who plays a bit of rugby because the wingers are scoring more tries, like St. Helens mm. and stuff like that. And I can always remember, OK, I'm quite a good team to watch, run the Areva trains and stuff like that. And yeah. It were good, mate. Uh, like them, them first couple of years with Morgan, Justin Morgan, they were brilliant. The the promotion winning year two thousand and six and the first year in Super League oh seven those those superb. And then uh, I think Justin might have left. I left in two thousand eleven. I think Justin might have left then, or oh, certainly two thousand and twelve at the latest. Um, but he came from Toulouse. I don't know if you remember. He had a really good run with Toulouse, uh, and he were, Toulouse were playing some attractive rugby in the Challenge Cup. I think he got onto the semi final. And they were, they were big raving, they were all raving about him. And I think he would have only been, at the time himself, he would have only been 30, early 30s. Yeah. So he was charismatic, he was he were fresh, his ideas were fresh. Um, and he was good, really good, mate. Uh, so yeah, it were uh, good times. Because you had that little uh, Papua New Guinea, I can remember, I used to get picked literally when no one else could turn up. Like... I was full-time 18th man, and I can remember Hulk out of way. <laughs> and um, who was it? Michaela Zoo. Was yeah, he the big prop? Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Like, I can remember when I was followers running in, and I was on the bench, basically, someone who got injured having breakfast, you know, 18th man crack. And I was, like, sat there. <laughs> and I can remember having to come on, but thinking, fuck this. Hulk out was probably one of the most intimidating places to go, because when you warmed up, the crowd come round, didn't they? Yeah. Like, that little bit. And I can remember... Um, I think Neil Baines was playing for Whitehaven at the time, quite a big lad. Yeah, I remember him, yeah. There was, just, there was just five people saying, just call him a fat bastard, just about that far off his face, <laughs> non-stop. And I just thought, oh, what a, where are we at? It felt like Beirut. Obviously, you've been in the <laughs> army, you probably think get used to, but <laughs> yeah. I just thought, no. away teams, it's an intimidating place, OK. Yeah. It is, and the, the crowd are always loud and, and noisy, making a racket, so it's a, it's good when you're on that side of the fence, mate. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Uh, but yeah, Macca. He um seen him I've seen him go pretty much hundred meters off kickoff a couple of times. I've seen him put people into next week with his with his shots and stuff like that. He still lives locally as well, Mac. Um Stanley Jean, he uh he came back for the first year in Super League as well. Because he was at Bradford at the time. But because Bradford Hulk AI gave him his chance and then Hulk AI went through some tough times and Macca went uh, Stanley went off to um Gateshead Thunder, I think he played it. Well, it was Hull, then they merged with Gateshead, so then it was Hull Sharks or whatever it was. Oh, then, yeah. he went to, then, then he went to, I think he had a spell at Huddersfield and Bradford. But Steve McNamara were coaching at the time and he just said to him, if OK, I do get promoted, I want to go back. I want to be released from the contract to go back and kind of repay. And, and it's done a full circle because Stanley's there now as, as part of uh, coaching staff. Um and he were looking after the defence last year. And I thought they the defended last year a lot better than they have done in, in previous years. So, no, he was a class player, though, wasn't he? He was one of them. He wasn't, yeah. 
it wasn't quite a fold, it wasn't quite a back, but it worked brilliantly because he was so strong, so fast. Like I'd say Stanley Jim, one of the most exciting players to watch, wasn't he? And they talk about how old he was. I don't know if you've ever seen his burst, it's just mm-hmm. out like that, but he Not was me, no. No, that's what I mean. There's a guy, White him, Jesse Joe Park, and they always say the same thing. They said he doesn't know exactly or anything like that because yeah. I just don't think it's a massive deal in that country. If you feel fit, you're still playing. If you don't, you don't. We have, we have a kid at um, Doncaster called Jason Tyler. He's a Papua New Guinean. But he, he was just scoring tries every week last year. Um, there was a, a guy from Sheffield as well, Menzi Yeary. I don't know if you remember the him. Big the big centre. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, used to, he, he used to crucify people every week as well with we, we his style so some good uh, some good imports come from PNG do, do you think it's a shame that Super League don't look in that league enough in the the Division 1 Division 2 because I, like over the years especially like Whitehaven and places like that there's players that would just walk into Super League I know Whitehaven's got Salafield so it stops a lot of players because they would have to give up a well paid job mm. and they can make uh, more money but especially in Yorkshire players do you ever feel like they just get overlooked a little bit um, as, as what you mean for the clubs would rather go overseas or whatever? Is that what you mean? Well, like go overseas and they get them in these youth systems, don't they? So they'd rather get like fifty kids and we're going to make these into rugby players. And it's like Jamie uh, Peacock. If it wasn't for second yeah. teams and stuff like that, he'd be lost to the game. Whereas I think exactly. now there's tons of players that are just going to be falling through systems or falling out of love with the game for a year and going back. And I just think now that. It, it's all set up a bit weird, isn't it? Without a second team and things, it's hard to bring players through. Like, if just say there's a good lad at Doncaster, you were still okay, but like, we could throw him in the second team, see how he goes. And you don't know, do you? He could be a well beaten. If, if he's terrible, he goes back. But now you haven't got that breeding ground. I think they've just, I think they've changed it now. I know Hull KR are running a reserve team next year. Right. I don't, I don't know if that's compulsory across the board for all Super League teams or if. Clubs are just deciding whether they want to do one or not. But they just, okay, I've just promoted, I think they've promoted five of their academy lads who were probably just, they were too old to have another year in the academy. And they maybe weren't quite developed enough yet in terms of a player to get a first team contract. So now they have got that, they have got that, uh, that bridge, you know what yeah. I mean? Fr- from academy to first team. So, there is opportunity, certainly at Hull KR, which is great for, for Hull KR. I don't know, like I said, if other clubs are doing it, but I think it's important because, like you said, there's, there's players that would just get lost to the game and they'll probably, unfortunately, be in the pub telling their friends what they could have been. That's uh, plenty of them, isn't there? In yeah, the yeah, yeah, but, but like I think in recent years, there's been a lot of them because of the system not being great. Whereas now, if they're going to bring the reserve team back, then hopefully... It'll just give some more players opportunity a little bit longer to develop into whether it's the physical attributes or the, the skill attributes or whatever it is. Just gives them that little bit more time to try and uh, develop and, and get a crack at the top level. Well, did you prefer it in Super League going to places like the JJB and places like that compared to when you're at Doncaster going to like, like say, Workitons, the White Havens, Keyfleys, and that? Did you did you notice a difference that way? Because some of the spots you turn up, don't you think, God, is this what I'm doing on a Sunday? Yeah, Pitch I, I, think, out I think, sand. yeah. Uh, the first year for me, like Doncaster and Hawke, are the first uh, 2005 and six, my first two years in the, the championship or League One, whatever it was called back then. Um, I didn't care, mate. I, I was just like, I'm playing, I'm getting paid to play rugby, something that I've loved since I was eight, nine years old. But then the step up to Super League, the first couple, of, I think we played, we, we were definitely at Huddersfield and Wigan in them first five games because I was just like, fucking hell, these stadiums are brilliant. What am I, what am I even doing here? Play. Yeah. So I, 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 it was a bit like that for me, them first, probably that first couple of months in Super League. Um, Millennium Stadium, played at Millennium Stadium first year in Super League. For the for the magic weekend, and I was just—I remember going out there. The roof were closed. I was looking up. I was thinking, "Fucking hell, this is mad." How have I got myself to this point? But like you said, there's a there's a different. I like going to the old salt of the earth kind of places. The, the Cumbria's, Workington. We went up there back in the last year. Featherstone, Post Office Road, little little uh, tucked away place in Feather- places like that. I, I, I love going to them places because they were the like the heartlands of rugby league are but then obviously having the opportunity to play in big fancy stadiums is I don't know it's just like a the old cliche the the dream 
so to speak. Well, they, they generate a different atmosphere. It's like Castleford are looking to go to a bigger stadium. St. Helens done it. I don't think St. Helens Stadium is the same as Nosey Road doesn't generate the same. Wigan have done it. I think Wigan Stadium is probably just a little bit too big for the crowds they're getting. It's like Castleford. They go into a 30,000 seat stadium or something. If you've got yeah. 6,000 people in a 30,000, it, it just looks horrendous, doesn't it? It doesn't sound yeah. the same. So I, it's the same with Wakefield. These teams that are got the, like they can fill the stadiums got now, I, I always think it's maybe not a benefit to go up, especially with the crowds not at the minute, not exactly going up. If they started going up, it would make sense. But yeah, atmosphere wise, it doesn't always work. I think we're, the, the Castleford Stadium is brilliant, but if you have you ever been to Castleford recent years? Uh, not in recent years, it was years yes. ago. I mean, it's brilliant because it's all real close. And yeah. From a plane, from a plane point of view, it's great because you can hear old mate on the sideline calling you every name under sun clear as day. Or whereas you go into bigger stadiums, it's not. It's more just noise than the the individual voices that you can hear. Um, but Castle have been talking about doing that for years, probably the last ten years. So. I don't know whether they're just talking about it again or if they've got something solid in the pipeline. But I always thought, and I know that because I'm from Normington in West Yorkshire, which Normington sat right in the middle of Wakey and Cass, yeah. Wakefield and Cass. So I I know, I get why they wouldn't have a, a community stadium, but looking at it now from a neutral point of view, to me, it'd make more sense because Wakefield Stadium's run down to the ground. Yeah, Cass, Castleford is the same. Wakefield Council governs the whole area of Wakefield, Castleford, Featherstone, all, all that. So why not just put a decent stadium? But then again, it's it's like, well, it's not our home. So you've got all that, the, the heritage and all that stuff. So, um, But, you know, if Cass get one up and, up and running, it's about time they did because I've been talking about it for many years. Well, there's a few stadiums. Like, I'm like Whitehaven. Whitehaven's been getting a new stadium since the 80s. <laughs> it's coming next year. It's always the crack. Oh, we've got a sponsor <laughs> yeah. now. Local pie shop. They're getting involved. We're going to get... And it's it, always just the same crack. And it, 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 Castford sound exactly the same. But like you say, Castford's probably got the best atmosphere. When Super League's on, there's certain grounds where you think, oh, that, it's like Huddersfield. Like, no offence to Huddersfield, but that stadium's huge. It just doesn't... When you watch it on the telly, it just... I can remember watching their game. I'm sure they're playing Catalans or something. So they hadn't brought many. Huddersfield. And it, it looked like a pre-season friendly. Yeah. And it just, the sound and things. I don't know if Sky Sports need to put the camera in maybe in a bundle of people or something. It just doesn't sound the same, does it? It's like yeah. Rhinos or when Bradford were big and stuff like well, that. It's, I think Uddersfield, all you can ever hear on TV is that bloody, one of them's got a cowbell, hasn't it? Bang ah, cowbell. yeah. So it's all you, all you ever tend to hear there. But um, I think you're right. For clubs like that where they've maybe not got a bigger follow, so big a following, sticking them in a big 20-odd thousand seat stadium, it just don't, uh, don't not 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 that it matters, but it don't look good for the viewer from Sky. They're like, well, where is everybody? But then that comes right back to the whole thing from what we mentioned at the beginning as well. I think before you started recording about the promoting of the game, make it, you know what I mean? Well, that, that, the thing with rugby league, they just don't make the players famous. It's like MMA. You know everything about Conor McGregor. You know the people that are fighting. You've got the good guys back. Call them heels, don't they? It's like wrestling. He's a good guy against his... And where's rugby league? Like, you you struggle to find out, oh, what, what does he do off the field? Does he... You know what I mean? You just don't... They don't yeah. make him known sort of thing. And it, you need, like, an Eddie Hearn or his dad or someone like that. Who's, like, if they can make darts players into celebrities that people want to know about. Fat guys, middle-aged fat guys coming on with different music. And how many thousands of people go and watch that? How can you not do that with rugby league? Like darts. Most people, I've been to watch darts. I didn't know when one match was starting, when one was finished. I just went to get steaming. Yeah. And you're just cheering every now and again. Whereas you could do that with rugby league, really, couldn't you? But the product would be yeah, miles yeah. better to watch in between. They, they did. I don't know if you remember. They did a, um, they did a piece... Uh, or, or like a series. I don't, know if, when, I don't know if it when Sam Tompkins came back from New Zealand, or just before he went. But he had like a, like a, you know, like a school, a Sam Tompkins School of Excellence or something like that. He was doing something where it were all Sam were running the show, the TV show. Yeah. So they, they did what you're talking about there. They did that with Sam for a bit, and then they did a really good piece on him recently. It was brilliant. I watched it through a link on Twitter. I don't know if it was Sky or what, but it was showing his property in France. And, France, and it, yeah. Yeah, it was brilliant. Uh, we were talking about Sean Edwards living down the road and all that. That was superb. But like you said, if they did that a little bit more, 
it'd be um it's just interesting isn't it, it, it that's it, what, you, well you, it's like when you're saying i, I watch that bit with sam tonkins like sean edwards because he wants to live near wigan is he's 500 miles away from the job he's got to do just because he wants right, to live yeah. on the same and like stuff like that anyone who's in would be like oh that's weird isn't it you wouldn't think that before wigan is that lives there and just yeah. just them little tearaway stories i i used to think i don't know if you remember rugby league raw that did I it don't about, remember it vaguely vaguely uh, remember that and they would follow a couple of fans going to the match always rough as now else yeah. go to the ground there'd be someone shouting get on side and stuff like that flagging everyone off but it it was dead like well obviously it was just raw wasn't it but that that gives you that like element of i don't something different it's like um that band now bad boy chiller crew yeah, yeah they're popular just because everyone knows a council estate like that where people are just getting steam and off the tits and that, and that that's why they're popular <laughs> aren't they exactly, yeah. and rugby league raw you, you could tie into that slightly couldn't you like these yeah. are the people that go and watch every week this is the life and just make it like I don't know because Channel Four's just got. Did you know Channel Four's just got yeah. ten games? Oh, that, I, yeah. I think that'll be good for rugby league because that's a different because there'll be different broadcaster, there'll be different commentators, they'll probably have a different spin on it. Be a different just, audience, mate. If yeah. you think about like people who, I mean, we don't watch Channel Four in our house, so, so I'm sure there's people uh, who have the certain channels that they watch and they'll, they'll pull a different audience in, I think. Might not be a massive one, but I think it's an opportunity to bring different people and the fact that it's free and they don't have to pay for the sky to see it as well. Um, but again, as long as it gets publicised. Yeah, yeah. As long as, it gets, as long as it gets some kind of publicity and some kind of traction, somehow be it through social media, players doing stuff, talking about it or whatever. I think I've seen a couple of players retweet it today on Twitter. Um so it's just the publicity side of things, mate, which, uh, because the product is great, isn't it? We, uh, and we can sit here being biased as rugby league men, but the product is good. There's not much better, I don't think, in terms of action. Well, you, you need to lean on, like, just say Channel 4. They might get Adam Hills. He loves rugby league, doesn't he? The comedian yeah. guy. Get him as maybe a co-host. Johnny Vegas loves it. You know what I mean? Just make it a bit more celebrity fire because that today there's that many channels. So what, you've got YouTube, you've got... The audience is huge, isn't it? But everyone, there's so much option for people to watch now, isn't it? You've got to try and make a bit of a statement each time you're on. Yeah. Like I say, if you get somebody like uh, Johnny Vegas on, that'd be brilliant. Yeah. Because it, it is his own audience coming to say, oh, what's Johnny doing now? It's just bringing an entire... So if you can get somebody big like that who does love the sport. Um, I know Stuart Pearce is a big fan, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Stuart Pearce, I know... Uh, Roy Keane Tommy. as well. Roy Keane's a big fan. So just get him. If it's only going to be 10 games, you get him in. They don't, yeah, have to know yeah. every, they don't have to know everything technical about what's going on, but just get them in to bring their audience in. Just well, smart marketing. Well, like you say, Strongman on Channel 5 at the minute, it's just like the earlier rounds. I've got Chris Kamara as a commentator. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at Chris, I don't think he's into Strongman. Do you know what I mean? But they've got him on there because he's popular, yeah. he's funny, he's just looking at, he's just coming out with stuff like, bloody hell, you've got a big back, haven't you? And it's just comical. <laughs> they've got him with a professional where he's have Johnny Vegas with someone. But Johnny yeah. actually loves rugby league, so he'll probably have a good idea, but it yeah. just makes it that little bit, because sometimes I think the problem with Super League, that they think everyone's as into rugby league as them. So you've got like, oh, he's lost his hips there, like, some random just watch it. it's like MMA if they went right into detail when they commentate people are like what, what's he talking about there you've got to be a bit more for the passive fan sort yeah. of thing so people can understand it the, the, yeah. the, 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 the fresh guys can get what you're talking about rather than coming out with a, a technical phrase or a technical term yeah totally A&B's right, need to get tight the, the people will be watching yeah. A&B's <laughs> get tight arm wrestles what the fuck are we watching are you? like if you were a random wouldn't you just be watching yeah. what, what am I watching are you sort of thing but out, out of all the grounds that you played at, which was uh, which was your favourite? Which was the most intimidating? Which one did you... Was it maybe Hull or anything like that? Because a derby, I can imagine a Hull derby being a bit tasty each time. Yeah, probably more exciting then than, than, yeah. than intimidating. Even though I were like pantomime villain, really, when I were at, when I were at Hull KR, because I'd had some off-field troubles and stuff like that. I were an easy target for them. So I, I used to get a lot of slaver from them, but I used to thrive off that. I used to quite enjoy it so I never really an into quite uh, that was a really good stadium to play at when it would when it would derby day for okay and Hull FC because it'd always be packed out there'd be probably 20,000 plus there both sets of fans just making massive noise trying to out sing and out shout each other so that were always good for the atmosphere 
the Millennium Stadium were probably my favourite in terms of just being in awe of being in a stadium so big and you know roof closed and and what it was. Um, but then I'd say intimidating. I'm trying to think from an intimidating point of view, there's there's no way of just jumping out immediately. But um, like Featherstone, I had a, I had a spell at Featherstone, so again I was never really intimidated by Featherstone. But I could say if I were going to Featherstone as somebody that didn't really know much about it. What about the signing they just made, by the way? Joey, uh, how do you is he the centre? Yeah, big powerhouse thing. I've seen a few working lads and white even lads uh, retweeting it uh, because obviously imagine doing a five hour shift then you've got to go and tackle that. Yeah, yeah. Apparently we're on eight hundred grand a year in NRL, so then it's coming time for Featherstone. I think he's on two hundred and fifty quid a tracksuit and a yeah. job. <laughs> that'll, that'll be the sort of deal like because yeah. you know you know yourself sometimes you get off <laughs> on the book you're like. That didn't sound that good. I don't know where they must have got money from somewhere because he was not going to come over for winning and losing money. Is he? He's not coming yeah. over for now. You get 300 quid a win and 100 a loss. They'll be, uh, they'll, have pulled, they'll have probably put chucked 100 grand at him. I would have thought something like that to, to, to get in. I'm quite surprised now if it were available. Surprising now, Super League teams of, but again, you don't, you don't know what agents are saying about him or coaches are saying about him. You don't, there's all that stuff to. To take into consideration, but yeah, back to the original question, mate. Featherstone, if if uh, if I were going there, not really knowing what it was like, I'd probably be like, "Fucking hell, this is a bit, this is a bit lively." Yeah, because because that's still quite close down at Featherstone, and um, but yeah, no, no way, no way. Like I said, mate, no way where I've always gone and thought. First, my first experience at Whitehaven actually. We'll talk about that. We got beat 50, uh, 51 nil. So Hull KR. We were winning the league comfortably. And I don't know if they'd budgeted for X amount of losses. And we'd we'd got to the point where we weren't going to lose that many games. So Justin Morgan put a team out up there. I think there were probably four or five of us who would, who would have been regulars that year. And rest were academy lads. We got beat 51-0. Um, the drop goal, I think, were probably in 79th minute just to take piss out of us, whoever it was oh, yeah. that, that slung it over. But I remember that day that were we were just getting off because we've been winning every week and then we went up there and got an absolute trouncing. We uh we copped a bit then. But um what about yeah. tough players? Who, who were the who were the like um because you have started playing round about there? I'm not saying there isn't tough guys now, but that old school tough guy where he's gonna swing an arm in your face, he's gonna get a bit horrible, yeah. isn't he? Like uh who, who, who were the ones that stick out where you thought, oh, God, because a winger scooting, people don't realise that's just like a goal, isn't it? You're coming in off the wing. Everyone knows what you're going to do. There's four or five props. They're all about this tight, and they're all going to yeah. hit you with an elbow or shoulder, and there's nothing you can do, is it? You just hope you don't get hurt. Who are the ones that you looked out for? I thought, oh, fucking okay, well, hell. The, the, not, not, when I came through, when, when I started playing, I think Mickey McAloran was just a young, I think he was a bit younger than me, Mickey. Well, he's a bit younger than me. He'll probably be, what, 34, maybe? 33, I'm 38 now. Uh, but whenever we played against Wigan, I'd always try and avoid running that fucker because I know he were coming with as nasty as possible. But I've got a lot, like, we've got a lot of respect for him. Um, get on with him quite well. We, we, we spoke about some stuff in past, a bit like off-field stuff, uh, cryptocurrency and all that kind of stuff because he's big into that, isn't Mickey? But he, um, anytime we played him, you could be his pal and you could have had as many conversations as you wanted with him, but you knew when you went on pitch, you weren't going to be nice. Whether you were his best mate or his worst enemy, you were going to get the same kind of treatment. So if ever we played against uh, Wigan, I'd be trying to fucking run away from him. Like, I'd put a <laughs> bit of footwork on. Yeah, just, just, try, just keep out of his way because you know that he was just going to be as nasty and uh, as aggressive as he possibly could, which I love that. Fucking love that. Love players like that. Uh, he's also probably... He'd probably be in, in, in my top five players who I'd like to have in, in my team if I was picking a team as well, you know what I mean? Because he was just that kind of player who I don't think Mickey would have the most, or I don't think he's the most skillful hooker that we've seen in Super League, but he's probably one of the hardest. You'd put him in that kind of Terry Newton category, so I would, I certainly would anyway. Um, so yeah, Mickey Mack, bit of a grub, my kind of, my kind of player. Was there any for, uh, any like props or not like that, or is it just... Uh... Is Mickey not or... really, not really. I, like, I've, I've never, I've never sat and thought that uh, about that in terms of nastiness. Because like, I don't think, I think as 
my era that were all phasing out a little bit. Yeah, you know, all, yeah. all, 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 all the all the old school thuggery, as some might call it, uh, which you know, each to their own. Some like it, some don't. But I think that was that were definitely phasing out as I started to come through. Um, so there weren't really none of that. There weren't, there weren't somebody who you knew that were getting sent off every week or were punching somebody every week. Um, but saying that, funnily enough, we had a player in our team, uh, Justin Poor, came over from Parramatta, came to Wakefield when I were at Wakefield. He's still a pal. I still speak to Justin now. He's a police officer actually in Australia, but he's he's going to be walking out of his job because of the mandates. Oh, the vaccine. Ah, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, he's going to he's going to be walking out because of all that stuff. But uh, he came over, and I'm sure he got sent off probably three or four times while he were over at. Uh, came to Wakefield for a year, whole okay, KR for a year, um, but he he was punching people, but didn't, didn't really see that too much. You know what I mean? And yeah. if, if I think if, if I think of a forward, he's the only one who I've known that's probably been sent off three or four times for the old school belting somebody, just just putting it on somebody. He laid Liam Farrell straight out, uh, put him on it. I don't, I don't know if he knocked him unconscious, but he put he laid him out. Um, he split Ryan Bailey. Uh, what else did I get sent off for? There were, there were three or four times anyway where he got red carded, but he was on my team, so so we're all right. Some like you say, people say toughest players. Sometimes the toughest players are the ones that you just don't like. A good winger that's got good footwork and stuff like that. They're worse, aren't they? Some fat lads yeah. just running into you. They shouldn't throw you sell at his legs or something like that. Or I, I always found the toughest players the ones like you said that were good players. You think, oh yeah. god, he's got good footwork. He's miles faster than me. They're going to kick behind me, uh, but he's strong as well. So you don't know whether to stay up or drop back. And they, they were always ones that, like people always say, like the old school tough guys. But sometimes just a good player is just a nightmare yeah. to play against, isn't it? He, he, he was good as well for um, his tackling technique, Gareth Ellis. I once got flattened by him uh, at Edinley. Went in, tried to put a bit of footwork on him, and he just ironed me out. Really, really good technique. Hurt as well. You know, just one of them that just hurts as well. Nothing dirty about it, nothing wrong with it, but just real good technique and, and kind of gets you right. In. Yeah, so... Uh, but you no, feel it, the embarrassment, isn't it, sometimes? When yeah. it gets, I used to do it off a bit. scrum or something. You think, oh, I'm going to put a step on it. You get uplifted and you're walking back to the wing thinking, you can hear people giggling Held and that. You're like, oh, yeah. I, you think, oh, I won't be scooting for a while yet. No. And then they normally put a bomb up as well, don't you think? Fucking yeah. hell, I don't yeah, need this. Be. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a good old sport, mate. And like you said, there's there's not the there's not the characters now that the war probably back in the day of who oh, were nutting and elbowing and all that that all that Kelvin Skerritt era. That's all kind of gone now, hasn't it? But uh, I think as far as toughness goes, there's still plenty of tough blokes running about. I think rugby league benefits as well for not being as in the public eye because I know loads of rugby players. You know rugby loads of rugby players. If social media was a thing in early 2000s and 2000s, oh, yeah. you're looking around and you're thinking, I think half the teams would be empty, wouldn't they? Because yeah. only takes one video now and you, I, you, the stuff you see on like a Mad Munder and things like that, you're thinking, he's lucky he's not arrested for that. Never mind, like got a contract. Look, he's not, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think rugby league in a way it benefits because you, some rugby league lads can go in nightclubs, do whatever the hell they want on the streets and stuff like Very rarely they get caught. And I think if it got more popular, I think they probably would have to like change it slightly. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Well, you've only got to look at the NRL. I know Super League will probably never get to the point of where the NRL is, which would be nice if it did. But being realistic, we're probably a fair way behind them in terms of how popular that is over there. But their their players are. There's always stuff coming out in spotlight over there about yeah. the, the he said she said stuff and. So, uh, so yeah, you're probably right on that side of things because we're, we're typically working class yeah. council estate lads, aren't we? From uh, from rugby league over in the in the good old UK. That's what I mean. <laughs> I like it because in Australia they're treated like David Beckham's and stuff That's like that, I mean, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. Like if if you're a journalist and you're trying to get some dirt on some rugby league lads, you just got to go in the bar that they're going to be in after that match, and you you could end every player, couldn't you? Know what I mean? Each week 100%. until it changed slightly. Easily, easily. Stuff we used to get, like, I, I think back to that first year in 2006 when I was full-time, we, uh, me and Scott Morell, we used to go out every Tuesday night around Pontefract, and it weren't just for a few pints, it was a write-off. Yeah. We'd go out on a, because we had Wednesdays off. <laughs> so we'd, we'd go home uh, from training, Tuesday afternoon, we'd be out for tea time, 
and we'd be out till like three, four in the morning, back partying at people's houses if they were a student's house to go back to or whatever. Uh, chaos, man, stuff we used to get up to back then. Like I say, we, even though we were, we were probably, nobody would have had a clue who we were anyway, but like doing that kind of stuff now, you just wouldn't dream of doing it. You wouldn't get away with it because somebody would be there with a, a bloody phone on, whether they knew you or not. So, it's, it's a bit of a throwback, isn't that Scott Morelli? He's like an Andy yeah. Gregory type. Like I, I, I have seen him on telly and I think what a great player, but body shape wise, He's not someone that looks like he's hammering the gym or fitness. He's maybe just got one of them body shapes where he's he's a little bit he's rotund. Not, he, he, he were never that big. He never that, <laughs> he's one of my he's one of my best mates, so I can I can I can give him a bit of slabber there. But he were never that big, and now he's running about probably near on 105, 110 kilos as a halfback. But he's still smart. He plays for Keithley. Played against yeah, him a couple yeah. of times last year. But he's um. The, his, his rugby league brain and, and how he can get a team around is he's just always had that natural ability to do that but as he's got older he just got more out of shape I remember him when he came to OKR in that, that first year 2006 he was probably 75 80 kilos uh, 19 year old 20 year old lad whatever he was um, and yeah and he's, he's grown he's yeah, grown as yeah. he's grown as he's got older as lad no, that's all. I mean, like, like, like you said, there's there's that many good players in the the, the division below Super League. And I, I like seeing ex Super League players going in there just to see how they get on because some really yeah. thrive and then others really struggle. I find, you know what I mean? Because it is it's a different game, isn't it? It's yeah. you, you can get your head taken off. The the skill level's a little bit lower, so it's a bit rougher. And some some players just really struggle, don't they? Drop them down. You get what what you what you find in the lower levels as well is which I I, I like it. I think it's great. Is people just chatting shit to you throughout the game yeah. and you don't really you don't really get much of that at the top end you get a little bit but a little it's different when you're playing championship or league one they're just giving you some real slabber i think it's great i, I love that kind of stuff um but like i say you don't really don't really get any of that at top level like everybody's just there to do the job and you know do it well whereas down bottom end it's a bit of banter a bit of fucking sledging a bit of Aggression. There's still a little bit of grub in there now and again. You might get your bollocks grabbed now and again, but it's not like, like I said at the beginning, it's not like the uh, the old school where you're getting your jaw broken or anything like that. Well, it, I think as well, play, um, like personality-wise, to come through. Like I think Super League, they went for that media training stage. You know, like players get media trained now, and it, yeah. it took the personality out of it. Like each person done the exact same interview. Sky Sports might as well just. Do it for them. Played well. We've got things to work on next week, and uh, yeah. hopefully we go again. And he's just, yeah. oh, just say something. It's something we different. Again. We go again next credit, week. And credit to the boys. Credit to the boys. I don't <laughs> want to take things for the man of the match. Uh, they're doing well this week, and uh, things to. And I, that's why I like that Jake Mamo. God knows what he was on about, but fuck me, it was just something different, wasn't it? And yeah, the, yeah. the odd player that just comes out with something, you think, oh God, is he saying something that isn't about defence? Or did he, did he swear twice, Mamo? I want to be yeah, you. yeah. He went fucking him and he went, oh shit. <laughs> Character. <clears throat> but that, that, that's yeah, what man. rugby league one don't know. That's what I mean. Like, like that's what everyone like everyone knows. Like that's why I hate when I say someone doing an interview on Super League who you know personally or someone who you and you think, oh. Be funny because I know you're hilarious. You know what I mean. Don't don't go down this route of like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Like you know what I mean. Kyle Amor's one of them. I've seen him on Sky Sports giving it all, Mister Mister Professional. And he is a fucking character. He's Kyle. He's he's got some serious banter, but he uh, he, do, he does a television voice done for his Sky stuff now when he's on Sky, and I think he's commentating as well actually on uh, our league. I'm sure he's doing a bit of commentary on there as well. Oh, he's the professional now, Kyle. He, I can remember at Whitehaven, he was playing under 21s. He was raging that he couldn't drink on the weight matches. Do you know what I mean? That was the type of person he was. You know what I mean? Now you're like, yeah. oh, get in there, Kyle. He's sort of totally, he, he just come, I think it was Jed Stokes, just come dead professional. Just, just, he was like a different person. It's like me, myself, and Irene. You've got that idiot <laughs> who's chasing after dinner ladies who's wanting to drink on the weight matches. And then now it's Kyle, who's, uh, yeah. like you say, he's had a hell of a class bloke as well, Kyle. He's playing again, isn't he, next year? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know he uh, uh, saw this tweet after the grand final because he didn't, he didn't think he did it. He didn't get on. Which oh, I found did he not? Bizarre. No, I found it totally bizarre. Did, uh, grand final, one of your front rowers don't get on the field in 80 minutes, which is fucking right. uh, I'm sure he was seething about that, but he put a light-hearted comment on his Twitter 
uh, about it afterwards, just saying you were absolutely knackered and <laughs> he's having a bit of crack like that. Well, he, he, do, sure. he does a good uh, Tyson Fury voice as well, doesn't he? Yeah, and he stuff does, like yeah. that. So, I mean, uh, he's, uh, he, he'd be one that he'd be like a Barry McDermott. I think he'll hang around after he's finished yeah, playing and yeah. stuff like that. But b- before we go, I've, I've got to talk about COVID. Five yeah. minutes on COVID if you've got five minutes. Might say, I like it. It, Ah, yeah. Ooh. So, you have you got in bother with social media over COVID? With whole KR well, and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I have, mate, yeah. And, I, and I've... Um... So right at the beginning, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll just give you my spin on everything because any, anytime I put anything on the social media, I always sign off as, I put regards to T-Foiler, like Tim Foiler, because I can get yeah. T-Foiler, all my mates and that. So um, I have a bit of crack with that. But I uh, I remember right back at the beginning, I was seeing stuff on social media, uh, apparently images from China of people just dropping dead in the street and people yeah. running up to them in them white full hazmat suits and all that. And straight away, I was just like, it's fucking so much not. This is like, what's going on? Is this a wind up or what? So I straight away, my alarm bells were ringing for me. Then that something dodgy were going off. And then as it all started to unfold and, and all that, I went down every rabbit hole you can imagine. So I went down the satanic, the child blood drinking, adrenochrome fucking rabbit holes. I went down the 5G fucking injecting particles into you. I've uh, been down all so I've been down all the rabbit holes, uh, and I've just formed my own view on it that um, there's, there's definitely it's definitely not about a virus. Uh, it's more about, um, in my opinion, I think that the the whole play is to try and get a global system that is like very much like China's social credit yeah. system. I just think that's that's the the whole um, thing that they're trying to uh, trying to bring in. So. Um, whether it pans out or not, I don't know. I think there's a, a strong enough uh, scenario, a strong enough fight back from everybody about that um, in UK in particular. So um, I think we'll be all right over here. But uh, whatever happens, happens, mate. It's just a. I, I, when I was at Hull KR, I got um, the the club. The club got a letter from the RFL about something I put on Twitter. Uh, and the RFL fined me two grand, which were £2,000. Is that what you got signed? I got, I got that's a fine, isn't it? From Rugby League, yeah. I got, I got a £2,000 fine for um, I put something on it with about uh, ethylene oxide on the um, on the swab is what you put up your nose. And I, I found something about that and read into what it was. So I put a comment on about that. It wasn't nothing nasty, but then the RFL pulled that up and a couple of other things, so they fined me. And then my contract were coming to an end at OKR, so they just said they weren't going to be renewing it. Um, so, so that was that. And then since then, um, I've been, my, my views have been pretty obvious that I do it. I speak, I speak about it in a way now more where I'm not trying to be a dick or I'm not trying to, um, not trying to uh, force anything on anybody. I'm just trying to, uh, my views and the reason I do see it like I do is because I've got two young kids and I'm more worried about how it's going to look for them in the next five, yeah. 10, 15, 20. That's what that's the thing that concerns me the most, mate. So, um, but yeah, I just think it's a bizarre old world we're living in at the moment. People who have got anything to say that goes against the grain a little bit seem to really get sent. I'm just telling you about my LinkedIn thing just before, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. So yeah, mate. But where do you stand with all that? Oh, well, it, it's just a weird one. I, I, I was like you. I always sign off with um, leading epidemiologist Eggerman's leading epidemiologist. Because, oh, <laughs> but I, I'm like, I've got comments saying, "Looked you up? You're not an epidemiologist." You're like, God, I could have told you that myself. You know, it's a joke. You know, like I did. I, I think I got an F in science. I'm an idiot. But I always <laughs> think if I'm an idiot, and you can tell, like. It's just something weird happening, isn't it? Like, it's like when we went into lockdown, I was saying to people, what we're doing, lockdown. When we come out, the virus will still be here, won't it? Yeah. So what are we locking down for? for? Yeah. Oh, but it targets everyone. I thought it targets... The average age of death for COVID was like 86. Average age of death was a year below. You're like, if you get COVID, you'll live a year. And people like, people got dead offended. And yeah. it, it was just weird, wasn't it, how it went on? And like, I think it's because it's so weird now. People just accept it. It's like... In Scotland, I put events on in Scotland. If it's over 600, you've got to check for COVID passports. 
despite even if you've had a COVID vaccine, you can still get COVID and pass it on. Yeah. There's no like correlation between like stopping the the virus or not like that. And you just like you say to people like, "Why are we doing that?" Like, I just to stop the spread. You're like, "Can you hear yourself? That, that makes no yeah. sense." There's a boat. There was a, a naval boat. They all got tested before they went out, and they're all double jabbed. They went out a couple of weeks into the voyage. The, there's a COVID outbreak, and you're like, "If you can't stop it on a boat where they're all double jabbed and they went out, what what chance have you got in a yeah, nightclub?" With? Yeah, that's the that's the thing. That, that's why I, I like I said, I don't I don't I don't try and. Um, I don't try and ram it down people's so throat from a point of view of being nasty or anything now. I just try and, like yourself, I've seen some of your stuff, just making humour out of it, really. Yeah, because some, yeah. You look at some of the stuff and you just think, is that, is that clear? It's like they're just taking taking a piss. We, we went to Tenerife before, went for four nights, and um, so we went, we went, went on the, whatever day we went, we had to do a test two days before we went. So if we, no, we flew on the Thursday, so we had to do a test on the Tuesday before we went. We got his results back on the Wednesday. Before we came back, we had to go to a hospital in Tenerife. We had to get swabbed there. That was like a lateral flow test, pretty much. Yeah. Get, yeah. get your result, pay, pay 35 euros each for that. Get your test, piece of paper that just says negative on it. Before you get on the plane, just show them that, and then you're on, and that was, that was it. Come back, and you had to do another test when you got back. And, and we're thinking, well... There's people on that plane who have been double vaccinated or whatever it is. They don't have to do none of that. No. But, but, but where, so where are the safest people, on, where, where are the most safest people to be around? Because we've been tested, we've been negative. They can catch it and pass it on, but because they've had, they've had their doses, they don't need to prove anything. It's just so weird, isn't it? It's, it's, it's like on the plane, you've got to have a mask on. I got Pringles. Just took the lid off the Pringles, just sat without a mask on the whole way, like, oh, just got my Pringles, you know what I mean? And you're like, and, but there's people looking at you, like, as soon as you finish food, like, you need to put your mask back on. You're like, I've been breathing for the last 40 minutes here. If you're going to catch it, you're going to catch it out, you know what I mean? It's just, there was an American couple in the queue before us, and some state in America, you've got to be double masked. One mask is, not, you've got to wear two, so one mask means you're unmasked, you're not allowed in the shop. So they had, like, two masks on. And you just think, what? And I'm like you, the next generation, we grew up went for nights out, went on lads, all of us and stuff. There was no problems. Whereas now it's going down that really, like in Australia, they're pulling people out of houses if they're a close oh, connection, putting them in a concentration camp for COVID. And you're like, is this is this normal? Do you know what I mean? Like everyone knows yeah. this is really weird, but the people that like say something about it, you're like, whoa. But I, I do think more people are seeing through it a little bit. They're a bit like, is this what we're doing for the rest of our life? I, I, don't, I don't fancy being threatened with a lockdown every Christmas and mm. things like that. So I, I definitely think it's growing. Because at the start, I was like you, people like, okay, Ellie's lost plot. Do you know what I mean? And then now you, you're that. probably in the majority. Mm. I know my parents both had their jobs because they wanted to travel. They wanted to go yeah. on holiday. They, their exact thing was, well, we want to go on holiday. Like, well, fair enough. Um, and now it's got to a point where the, if they haven't had a third one, they don't get the note classes vaccinated yeah. and they're like is this so they've got to the point now where they're like are these people for real uh, they won't be going for that me in fact my dad's had problems with his um, chest ever since my dad's a tough old bloke really and he no i say old he's only 56 but he's, he's a tough old fellow my dad and he um he's had to go to the doctors for the first time in probably 15 years since his second job yeah, uh, yeah. because he's had, been having problem with his chest so he's having to have checks and all that kind of stuff um Oh, because you want to go on holiday. Well, that, 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 like I'm one of them. I'm not anti-vax or anything like that. If you want to get the vaccine, yeah. that's no problem. If you don't want to get it, it's not. It's like the flu one. I can't remember people walking around saying, "What you haven't had your flu jab, you murderer." Do you know what I mean? It just uh, and now people seem to think it's all, they have like these things on ATV and that, don't they? Do you think unvaccinated are allowed to be uh, should be allowed out the house and that? You're like, okay, now this is a dark. This took a dark turn, hasn't it? Would you invite someone vac unvaccinated to your Christmas dinner? But I, saw the, that, I saw the Aussies talking about that on their Channel 9 News, weren't they? Or Channel 7, yeah, whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. How to Unbelievable approach them vaccinated, you like. And not just that, like, it, like where, where does this lead? Because it's only getting worse, isn't it? Like, you look at these countries like Austria and Germany, it's mandated now. You're like, what they're going to do? Pin people down. And but Israel, you're going to have that. four. Mate, it's not it's, it's not going to stop there, though, is it? It's going to be probably no. every six, every six months or every four months or whatever it is. And, I don't know. I just think it's. I think it's bizarre. I think it's bizarre. The, the, the other scary thing for me is that recently they've been talking about 
smallpox has been tossed up on it. I don't know if you saw that one. Oh, Bill Gates. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you, he, he tossed up what's happening now, doesn't he? So you've got to take what he says. He'll have the pattern for it already. Of course he will. He'll, he'll have this he'll, 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 have, he'll have funded all the research for it. He'll have paid all the you know, Imperial College in London and Chris Whitty and Valance and all them. He'll have done their little backhanders. Just research this for his lads and when I give you the nod. Uh, well, he's on the climate change as well, isn't it? Like, like you say, I'm a self conscious fest moron don't know anything about these subjects but people are like oh you shouldn't have a say unless you know about it and you're like well bill gates isn't trained in it but he seems to get on telly and what should we do yeah. bill and you're like what's bill got to do with this i'll ask him for advice on sweaters and computers they're the only things that <laughs> bill gates is good for you know what i mean like clever bloke but he shouldn't be having this much sway because he's got the money involved and it's the same with the climate change thing and stuff like that the only things on social media that get regulated with a little column underneath doesn't it like my auntie put on meant to be sunny today get your real weather <laughs> advice from me you know what i mean on facebook <laughs> and stuff and it's the same with covid if you mention covid or a vaccine get your real Stop covid going, information yeah. here from it and you're like they're the only two things that are regulated online and you always think yeah, are they connected in some way they're like mm. in italy they call it a green pass don't they? it's not a covid pass it's a green pass and then they're going to tie it in with other things and think that I'm like you, I think it's just all to do with getting so everyone has to scan in places now to do with the virus, just so everyone's scanning in, be like China, yeah, like a point system. It. Yeah. And then if you, if you, if you, I don't know, if, you, if you're traveling by car more instead of by bike, or if you, if you, I saw something where it's if you, even if your diet isn't great, you get yeah. deducted points, you get deducted points for that because they can just see through. The scan in, they know, uh, they know what you're spending, what you're spending it on, and I don't know. I just think it's weird. weird. It's all gonna unfold over the next, I don't know, six months or whatever. I would have thought, but I would like to think if there's a push for that stuff here in the UK, that there'll be a, there'll be a strong response. That's um, what I, that's what I mean. I think they've left it too long for the UK because you can see in Scotland it hasn't worked, Wales it hasn't worked. We've got a lot. There's a lot more outspoken people in England, I think, than some of these countries. And we're not as regulated as some places. And I, I, I'm like you, I think if it starts coming in that way, I think there's enough voices now that are starting to say, well, I'm, I'm not going to go with this and things mm -hmm. like that. Hopefully, but I'm saying this, and then next year we'll be doing this in a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> saying that's coming. The, the, the thingy one's bad, mate, the Australia one. I saw I saw that today where um, they're literally going, they're going door to door now, aren't they? Yeah, with, take, with they were taking like a group of Aboriginal people against the will to this Imagine camp. what they're thinking. Imagine what they're thinking now, the Aboriginal people. Imagine what's going through their mind. Right now, they'll be thinking, fucking hell, what were they doing to the Jews back in the day? Taking, yeah. them, to, taking them off to camps, rounding them up and taking them off. So they, they'll be, they'll be, they'll, and rightly so, they'll be, uh, I think they'll be well, well and truly worried. That's all they should be. Everybody should be. Everybody should be in fucking uproar about it. Not normal. Ah, well, that, that's the thing when they say, oh, it's the new normal. That was the worst saying, wasn't it? Like, no, no, I just, it's like rugby. Do my head in with rugby where you can't have scrums. And I thought, Who, who's made this rule up? Do you know rugby's played? You're rolling around on top of each other. You get, you're on the bus together. You get showers together. But that thought of the scrum, nah, it's too dangerous. And when they do yeah. like uh, the national anthems in rugby, they do like two metres apart. You're like, what the fuck? They'll have sat next to each other on the bus, changing rooms. <laughs> it's just insanity, isn't it? You're looking around, it's, it's like... Crazy. When, when you, you have to sit down, so you don't have your mask on when you sat down. I can remember the scientists describing that as having like a certain section of the swim pool where you have a piss, which it is, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like, no, we're safe over there, have a piss. And it's just so many like, and when you look at it that way, it's funnier, isn't it? Because you think that just makes no sense. We're all breathing the same air on the plane and that couldn't be any more circulated air. And some people are still like, just don't be selfish, double mask. I just yeah. get on with it. You're like, oh, it's... just do it. Just, just do it. Just for the sake of it. Just for an easy life. But then, that what? Where does it again? Where does that lead us? Oh, just, just, just comply. Just do it. You know, save any hassle. And it's just. I think that just leads us more into the lion's den, mate. I think. I don't know. It's very interesting times. And like I said, the reason I just talk about it like I do and <clears throat> and share my opinions is not because I'm overly uh, bothered about me. More no. bothered about more bothered about the kids. They're only mine are only one and three. So yeah. I just I'm just thinking like if you, if I think back to when I were when I was probably 
13 years old. I don't even think we had mobile phones then. No. Or if we, no. or, if we or if we, or if we did, there was very, very new. Might have got one of them with Snake on. Do you remember yeah. them ones? Yeah. But now my kids are going to grow up with all that technology and all this shit's coming into play, metaverse and all this, this stuff. You know, what, what, where's all that going? And what's it going to be like for kids when they get older? So, so yeah, mate, I just think uh, even though it's a small voice in a big ocean of noise, as long as you're sharing something. And I think how, how you do it, I've seen how you do it, and I like to think how I do it, is a way where people don't think I'm overly serious about it or, or nasty, certainly not nasty about it, but more trying to make light-hearted humour out of it because so much stuff to throw in at us, mate. It's fucking quite funny anyway, isn't it, really? When you sit and oh, well, think that, about that's it, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's comical. It's like them COVID marshals and stuff like that. You think, is this, yeah. is this really what you're doing? Is this, we're paying someone to go around to shut down parties and things like that. And people grassing. I hated it when... Uh, the NHS, you have to clap for the NHS. People like, yeah. what well, you don't believe in clapping? Went, no, no, I don't mind, but I think they'd prefer a wage increase, proper PPE. I think they'd rather have that than a false gesture on a Thursday. And them same people that were like, because it got out of hand and it started off with a clap, then it was pans, then you've got to get yeah. steaming on a Thursday. You've got to have the disco <laughs> decks out. It went from that, it was nothing to do with the NHS. People just like making a fuss. But they're the same people this year who are a bit like, if they haven't had the jab, they should be sacked. You're like, you, you were clapping them last year. Oh, 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 okay. She works for NHS. She's got a, got a really good job at NHS, and she's like, "Well, April first is like going to be out of a job." You know what I mean? But then there's been like, "Well, why don't you just get it? Why don't you just get it? Well, why? Why should I?" Yeah. <laughs> it's just that. It's just that people. It's like people have just been conditioned that much into thinking that, well, actually, I haven't got a choice, and I should just do what they're telling me to do. Well, well, people don't realise the next step will be something they're not comfortable with. So, like, people who double jab now, like, just get a jab, I'm all right. Then the next step on this pass or whatever, be like, got to go gym four days a week. Whoa, 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 didn't sign up to this. <laughs> well, I'm not allowed to drink anymore. Well, oh, no, this has gone too far. No, it went too far when the force, you, you know what I mean? That That's yeah. the jumps people don't realise. Whereas now, if you double jab, you're like, just get on with it. Just get on with it. But not realising, like, we've come a long way in 17 months, haven't we? Not allowed to hug your grandma. Now you've got to have a pass to get in a nightclub. Give this yeah. another 17 month. It's, you're going to talk a, a weird place. I think that's, a, I always say that to people when, when, when I do get in a conversation about it, just stop and th- just try and have 10 minutes to yourself and think of everything that has been said to us, what we must do or what we must not do over the last two years. If you go back five years and think, you know, think about all that stuff happening, you'd be like, shut up, you fucking idiot. I'll never happen. Yeah. And it's all, uh, but yeah, crazy times, mate. Crazy times. No, no, but uh, for the kids. Oh no, I, yeah, but uh, cheers for coming on, Ben. Anyways, and like you say, I'll get, I think because of the COVID crack, we can have this crack again because uh, it's only going to get more mental every month and stuff like that. So, but yeah, uh, yeah. cheers for coming on, pal. Pleasure, mate. If uh, if I don't see you on LinkedIn, mate, I'll see you on Facebook. <laughs>